Is it good Sunday morning? MG. Come on. Move. Good morning. Just a quick one today. I can't stay too long. Uh, yesterday at the uh, local coffee shop run by the local Baptist church. There it is. No, it's still sticking out. Oh, I give up. There. Yeah. Here. Um, there was a food giveaway for folks who lost food in all our power outages. Well, they gave me this unlabeled bag of fruits, which fortunately I recognized as persimmons. I'm going to step away for just a moment to cut one in half and show you the inside. So don't go away, I'll be right back. Let's put that in the chat. Okay. Here's the inside. Now, the thing is, these are not ripe. The seeds in the center are not fully formed. But, and I'm used to persimmons having three leaves, not four. So I don't know what variety this is. But it's a nice sweet fruit that tastes really yummy. I have one baking in the roaster, the electric roaster. Because I don't have a working oven, but the roaster will do just fine. Let me see. Participants. Just me, myself, and I. And yet, the other thing he says, there's two people listening. I guess you're anonymous or you're Joseph. Uh, oh, it's Tim. Oh, yeah, I have a toaster oven, too, Tim. Uh, but the darn thing wouldn't fit. So rather than improvise something smaller not as tall i decided to use the roaster they say about 20 minutes at 400 degrees uh should do it but i'm i'm going to go half an hour at 350 for a half of a persimmon to bake now you can add cinnamon and honey or you can pour maple syrup over it. Don't forget the cinnamon. It's a nice sweet fruit uh, from Asia. At first I thought it might be tomatillos, but the inside gave it away. It's a persimmon. Tomatillos, tomatillos are related to tomatoes and used in salsa. But persimmons, oh man, little slices or cubes of persimmon in a plain sugar cookie really dress things up. Yeah, it's a rather large persimmon. But uh, I, I'm kicking myself because years ago I lived in Garden Grove, uh, the poor part of Orange County. And the neighbor's tree, the neighbor's persimmon tree hung over the fence. And 
I just didn't know how to eat a persimmon. I asked the neighbor first, what kind of tree is it? And she said, persimmon. And then I asked, how do you eat them? And she didn't know. So I never tried them. I should have. I had an abundant supply from her tree. But now I have persimmons courtesy of the local churches and other charities who held a food giveaway because many of us lost food in the uh, power outages from that horrid storm that came on Thanksgiving Day, snowed us in, broke all the branches on the trees. Hi, Crichton. Now, um, I'm... Oh, I'm typing and my cursor isn't in the box. Good morning, everyone. There. It's hard for me to type and talk at the same time, especially now that I'm beginning the long process of giving up cigarettes. Um, I'm using hypnosis. Uh recordings on YouTube and and all kinds of advice. Now one particular very short video pointed out that when you think you're craving a cigarette, it's probably one or more of three things. First, when you smoke, the caffeine from your coffee breaks down faster. So if you keep on drinking the same amount of coffee, you're going to get a caffeine overdose. So you must cut down on coffee. Second, you're dehydrated, but smoking uh, reduced the symptoms of dehydration without actually curing it. Smoking makes dehydration worse, but you don't notice it as much. Well, I already drink tons of water and juice. The third thing is hypoglycemia. Nicotine kind of forces your fat to release sugars into your bloodstream. So when you don't smoke, you need to eat right. You need to get, you know, good nutrition so that you don't suffer low blood sugar. Now, I've found uh, actually most people eat less when they smoke. I eat less when I'm not smoking. My tummy objects to food. And I've always, even before I ever lit a cigarette, I've always been a snacker. I snack all day long. I don't... Um, well, that's what I smell like. Been looking all over to see what was on because I turned off the stove top, the heater, the electric portable heater, but uh, I still smelled something not quite burning. It's the roaster where I put the persimmon. Hmm. I forgot the cinnamon, by the way, but I can add it later. Um, still, I'm not going to stay here too long today. I'm just hoping YouTube doesn't decide my internet connection is too weak and disconnect me before I'm done, as it usually does. So anyway, I've got a tree branch that's about the size of a tree in my yard. Two more smaller branches fell on top of it during the storm. And I'm waiting for a friend with a, a chainsaw to come get it out of there. It's, uh, I'd say, at least 25 feet uh, long branch, a 25-foot branch from the oak tree, which is now pretty much a 150 foot tall stick. It has a couple branches that didn't fall, 
but it's mostly the trunk. Good thing I had it trimmed recently or it would have landed on my roof and done some damage. Anyway, um, we won't have any more snow for a while, at least a week. So I have tons of yard work to do before we get more snow. Most of it has melted now. The berms that the snowplow makes, of course, take longer to melt away because they're packed tight and they're tall. Some of those berms are as tall as I am because we had so much snow in such a short period of time. Now, three feet of snow might not sound like much, but when it comes in about an hour, it's a lot. And it was wet snow. It wasn't the fluffy stuff. It was really heavy. And some entire trees came down, and most of our trees dropped branches. Hence the power outages from trees falling on the electric lines. Now, uh, let's see. Um, oh, it was Friday morning. I was on the Friday Farcast. You can find it on YouTube. Uh, Friday Farcast. Uh, I was interviewed for two hours by uh, Robert Phoenix. I'm not that bad at names. Come on. Robert Phoenix. He has two YouTube pages. So to listen to the Friday Farcast, make sure you get his Friday Farcast page. It was challenging and interesting. He's an astrologer, but not the woo-woo kind. And he did a chart for my late ex-husband, Philip K. Dick. And that chart was spot on. You've got to see it. I kind of dissed Phil a little, but it, it was the truth. He just could not be faithful to one woman. It wasn't in his makeup. And, uh, um, well, maybe oddly or maybe just strangely enough, it showed in his chart. And it showed that we belonged together, which is interesting because when I got um, the book, Glynis Has Your Number by Glynis McCants, I think I can spell it right. Glynis McCants, the numbers lady. She claims that she uses the numerology that Pythagoras developed. I have no way of knowing. I, I didn't know Pythagoras developed numerology. But anyway, according to what I gleaned from her book, Phil and I were soulmates, but we were toxic to each other. <laughs> I don't know. I still haven't forgiven him for telling everyone that I left him. Because the truth is, he hired a moving van and took all the furniture to his new apartment. And told everyone that I left him, and they believed him. He even took our best cat, Harvey Wallbanger. There's a story about Harvey. He he was cross-eyed. That's how he got his name. When he was trying to go down the hall, instead of going through the doorway, he would bump into the wall or the door casing beside the hall because he was cross-eyed. He saw two hallways and wasn't sure which one was the real one. Well... One time in Phil's third floor apartment in Santa Ana, Harvey was out on the balcony and he 
Phil. And Phil ran downstairs as fast as he could, which was never very fast. He really had some physical disabilities. Anyway, he couldn't find Harvey. He said it was, sometimes he said it was the next day. Sometimes he said it was three days later. He found Harvey in the basement parking garage. Poor Harvey. At least he was okay. Yes, I, I named Harvey, by the way. Harvey Wallbanger. I, I knew the name of the drink. I'd never had one. It's like a screwdriver with uh, grenadine. Tastes kind of like bubble gum. I've had some here and there since then. You know, it's like vodka, orange juice, and grenadine. And a screwdriver is just vodka and orange juice. Bartenders these days don't know the drinks quite often, at least not by those names. So if I really want one, I haven't haven't lately, but if I wanted one, I would have to say I'd like a screwdriver with grenadine because they don't know what a Harvey Wallbanger is. And they seem to know what a fuzzy navel is, except these days it's just orange juice with peach schnapps. It used to have vodka and either Galliano, which is a, a licorice flavored liqueur, or my favorite, grenadine. It's a syrup made from pomegranates. It's what they put in a Shirley Temple. I went to a Chinese restaurant with my son once uh, when he was young and he wanted a Roy Rogers. They didn't know what that was. Well, it's like a Shirley Temple, except it's made with cola, usually Coca-Cola instead of 7-Up. I don't know how I got into drinks, but I'm really loving these um, persimmons. I almost call them pomegranates. I like pomegranates, but it's a real pain because the seeds are so small and there's so little fruit on them. And I have to put on my dentures to eat them. Anyway, if you find Friday Barcast on YouTube, you can see two hours of me discussing things like Philip K. Dick and his exegesis with Robert Phoenix. I'm, uh, I'm rocking because it helps with the cigarette cravings. I'm quitting because they cost too much and I kind of like to breathe. But man, it's going to take a while. Phil always wanted me to quit. I often had to smoke outside because he suffered asthma since childhood, so it really bothered him. But then, about once a week, he'd smoke a cigarette, just one, and it would be another week before he'd smoke another. But he kind of cheated because he had Dean Swift snuff, <clears throat> the kind you sniff up your nose. One time, let's see, his ex-girlfriend, Linda Levy, had a new boyfriend who was an undercover cop. I can name him now because he got killed years ago. Some scumbag shot him during a drug raid. <coughs> George Aguilar, a really good guy. Well, Phil... You know, Linda told us that George was a, an undercover cop, but don't let on because I'm not supposed to tell you. Reminds me of the line, can you keep a secret? Yes. Well, so can I. 
anyway, well, I'm never quitting tea, Strontium. I might quit coffee. Maybe. Anyway, so we're not supposed to let on that we know that George is an undercover cop. So De Phil goes with a couple little tins of Dean Swift snuff. And when we visit Linda and her new boyfriend, George, and Phil went on to convince George that it was really cocaine. Pretty soon, George calls Linda into the bedroom for a private conversation. And Linda comes out and says, uh, I am told that I must inform you of, of his vocation or something to that effect. So Phil then had to convince George that it was just tobacco and perfectly legal. <laughs> uh, wow. Phil would do things like that, play games, and then complain about other people who played games. Coffee. Coffee just a sip so I don't end up with cigarette cravings, water, and of course juice, courtesy of the community food giveaway, I have a whole bunch of cranberry apple raspberry juice. They also gave away chicken. I wish I'd paid more attention to it before I popped it into the crock pot because now I have to let the juices, the chicken broth, cool so I can scoop off the fat from the top. There is an awful lot of fat on, on these chicken legs. Just the legs, not the whole chicken. Four frozen solid chicken legs. Took forever to thaw. Anyway... I am grateful for it. Um, making chicken soup and I'm eating chicken and freezing chicken and so forth. I plan to try to make something kind of on the Asian side, maybe an orange chicken. I have some oranges and lemons. You need lemon juice too. I'll have to look up a lot of recipes. And thank you, Strontium. I really can't stay much longer, so if you have any questions or comments, get them in now. It's a lovely sunny morning. The problem is it's 38 degrees. Barely more than freezing. But I can bundle up and go out and take some loppers to the smaller parts of the oak branches that fell. As it is, I cannot open my back door, but neither can a burglar. So in a way, it's kind of a good thing. There's, you know, this big old tree branch in the way it the little parts are up against the door it isn't sideways it's perpendicular and parts of it are up on the roof but they're just the twiggy ends not the big old log part of the branch it'll make someone some nice firewood and maybe I can get someone to clean my chimney without trying to sell me a thousand dollar pellet burner to replace my nice old wood stove we'll see anyway i thank you all for listening but please go on over to friday farcast if you haven't got enough of me it's on youtube and it, it's a good show Pythagoras led a cult that worshipped numbers, I think, or maybe it was Euclid. Yeah, pro sounds like Pythagoras, Strontium. Pythagoras was a part of the Elysian mystery cult. 
Well, thank you, Crichton. Tom Dish, I never actually met him, but Phil wrote that Tom Dish had come to visit, but I don't remember that. I suspect that many of his published letters are actually dated wrong. There's mistakes in the dating. Hi, Charles, and, oh, wow. Anyway, um, I have absolutely no memory of meeting Tom Dish, so, but the dates in the letters are in, in the time that we lived together, so I think they're, they have the wrong dates. And toward the beginning of the published exegesis, there's a letter that I know is misdated because it's dated 1974, but it refers to things that happened in 75. I didn't know Tom Dish, but I, I read Camp Concentration, supposedly one of his best, kind of... Uh, kind of based on the Tuskegee experiments where uh, prisoners were not treated for syphilis because they wanted to study it. It's loosely based on that. Yeah, I know Tom, Phil wrote some uh, really strange letters and he didn't necessarily mail them he was testing the FBI he would drop the letter in the dumpster behind our apartments saying well if they're not watching me it's trash and if they are watching me they can go get it well hi Kev um I just got love and hugs, so I'm going to purr. But Phil was trying to convince whoever was harassing him, and he was being harassed, that he was crazy and harmless. And harmless because he was crazy. He really did have suspicions of Stanislav Lem. Lem uh, published Solar Lottery in Poland, in, in Polish translation, of course. And when it came time to pay the advance on royalties, Lem could not get hard currency. So he told Phil he should fly to Poland and spend his money there. The problem is... Polish Zolotti wasn't worth very much, and the advance was only 750 Zolottis. And Lem insisted that that was a lot of money. Well, it might be a lot of money if you could get free airfare. Phil was afraid he'd fly to Poland and not be able to return to the United States. Oh, hi, Oswald. No biggie. You didn't miss much. I was talking about persimmons, the fruit. Lovely, sweet, awesome fruit that many people don't even know about. I think it's best if you bake it with some cinnamon and then pour a little honey or maple syrup over it. Real maple syrup, not that corn syrup they call pancake syrup anyway um phil really suspected that if he went to poland to spend his 750 zelotes he'd never come back because they wouldn't let him 
Also, as far as accusing Tom Dish of putting secret messages in his book. Now, this is all according to Phil, and he did make stuff up, but I think this is real. Back before I met him, when he was in San Rafael, and actually... Not sure whether it was before or after his house was invaded and torn apart. This acquaintance told Phil that he, he Hal, was working for an organization so secret that even the CIA didn't know about them. And he wanted to recruit Phil to put secret messages in his novels. Oh, nutmeg and cardamom. Oh, you're making me hungry, Charles. Although I usually go for Chinese spi five spice because I like cloves, but they're a little strong with the five spice. They're kind of, you know, mixed in with other things. And I tried to buy star anise and I looked at the price and said, nah, I can get Chinese five spice cheaper and it has star anise in it. Anyway. So, Phil, I thought that was weird because it can take two years or more for a book manuscript to be published and distributed. But it is possible that they wanted Phil to travel the world as a famous author because no one would suspect him of anything like being a spy. And the secret messages was just a baloney. Phil said at one time this guy Hal told him that his television set was watching him. One of the inspirations for A Scanner Darkly. And Hal actually took off, took off the back of the television set. This was long before flat screens. A television was a piece of furniture. It was huge. So Hal got a screwdriver and took off the back of the set and showed Phil the camera inside. So apparently his television was watching him. Ah, I've already stayed longer than I'd intended. So much to do, so little motivation. But I really do need to batten down the hatches before we get another storm. There's, in addition to the huge oak branches, there's all kinds of little branches scattered all over the place. My yard, my driveway, my roof, my garden. And I, what I really want to do is take loppers to the little branches parts of the branches that are blocking my back door. I posted a photo on Facebook. It looks like a whole tree and it's just one branch, but it's huge, about 20 feet long. So anyway, um, my persimmon should be about ready. I don't smell it yet, though. So maybe I better mix up some cinnamon and other spices with a bit of honey and pour it on top of the persimmon before I finish it off. It, it, uh, finish in the sense of finish the cooking. Mm, I'm starting to smell it now. Ah. Uh, so if you ever see these weird looking little things in the grocery store, these are persimmons, sweet, lovely, delicious Asian fruit. This variety is very firm. So I've been looking up ways to soften it. And one is baking. Another thing you can do is wrap it tightly in plastic wrap and put it in the freezer. They say that when it's deprived of oxygen, it softens. I recommend persimmons. 
No, I don't have trees now, Oswald. I my neighbor had one back in eighty four or five back in Garden Grove, and it hung over the fence into my yard. But our local food giveaway had this unlabeled bag of persimmons and among all the people there, I knew what they were. You can just eat them, but you don't want to eat the peel. It's nothing wrong with it, except it's impossible to chew. And I don't recommend trying to peel them either. Make the fruit soft and spoon out the meat from the inside. Oh, Tim made a joke, a pun. Puns are the lowest form of humor, but I like them. Phil used to tell a particular type of pun known as a Swifty or a Tom Swifty. He'd say, ouch, that hurts, Christ said crossly. And he insisted that there were no other Christies. It, there were no other jokes of that sort. So, of course, I had to best him. Uh, Phil's birthday would be tomorrow. Well, I got to tell my Christie first. My mother was a virgin, Jesus said, Mary Lee, as in merrily. My birthday's in June. It's a good time to be born because it isn't so dang cold. And yet, I can deal with cold better than heat. On this mountain, we consider 50 degrees warm in the winter. And in the summer, it gets up to 80 degrees. But the people down the hill are suffering with 90s and even 100 degrees while we're going, oh, my God, it's 80 degrees. Turn off the heat, please. Put a lampshade on the sun. Uh, this was a highly unusual storm. I think at my house I got a total of four feet or close to it. But on the first day, two feet fell in about one hour. And it was Thanksgiving, which was canceled, all the community events and everything. And my friend Catherine couldn't get out, and I couldn't go to her house because of the downed trees. And her power went out when she was in the middle of cooking Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> So fortunately, she was able to finish it off on the stovetop, which is gas. Uh, but uh, she couldn't leave her house because the emergency personnel told her not to go outside because there were live electrical wires on the ground. But the next day, day after Thanksgiving, she actually trudged out on foot to bring me turkey dinner, <laughs> which, you know, I was able to reheat because my stovetop is also gas. The problem is, you see, the pilots are electronic, and they don't work anyway. I'm used to lighting the stove with a match now but you cannot get the oven to come on, not even with matches. So, uh, anyway, that's why I have an electric roaster and a toaster oven. The chicken, however, I couldn't find the right size pan to, to roast it, so I put it in the uh, slow cooker, the crock pot overnight 
so it would fall apart and the juices would be in the bottom for soup. I just didn't count on all that fat, so now it's cooling off so I can skim the fat off the top of the chicken stock and make soup. Anyway, I really got to go, and I want to thank you all for listening, and thank YouTube for not cutting the feed this time, as it usually does. It usually says, um, your internet connection isn't strong enough, or isn't reliable, or something like that. So once again, head on over to Friday Farcast on YouTube for the two-hour interview. Well, food is good for you, Strontium. Just make sure it's it's healthful food. I obviously don't have to worry about gaining weight. I want to gain weight. Uh, but if you worry, eat fruits and veggies. Tons of them. And here's a trick. It takes more calories to chew celery than you actually get from it. You can have as much celery and lettuce as you want. But be careful with lettuce. It can upset your digestion. Enough of that. Thanks again. And all of you take care, and I'll see you next week unless I decide to come on sooner. Bye-bye.